<clears throat> All right, recording, I think, is on. There we go. All right, Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> so last week uh, we began this, this section, uh, chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Uh, we will finish that up this week. Let me go back and just read that whole section again <clears throat> to start us off, and then we'll we'll dive into it. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Mine says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So again, last week we really looked at these first two pieces of it, which were really locking down the importance, the, the preeminence of the, the Old Testament law. We saw certainly Jesus here puts his stamp of approval on it. We noticed that the prophets were the ones who also put their stamp of approval on it. And of course, God was the one who originated it. So you kind of had those, that threefold witness to the, to the law in what we, we talked about last week. <clears throat> so we want to get into verses 19 and 20. And let me mention up front that we're going to be walking in the middle of a paradox uh, as we talk about this today. And the paradox is this. On the one side, uh, as I mentioned at the end of class last time, one of the purposes that, that Jesus had for coming was to enable us to keep the law. The other side of the paradox is it's impossible for us to keep the law. <laughs> so, so, as I'm speaking today, <clears throat> your brain will be jumping back and forth between those paradoxes and arguing with yourself about, well, wait a minute, isn't it true that it's impossible for us to keep the law? Well, wait a minute, isn't it true that we're supposed to be able to keep the law? Uh, both of those statements are true. And uh, so uh, you can just have to deal with it in your brain as, uh, as we go back and forth between those two statements. <clears throat> All right, having given you that uh, annoying statement up front, let's uh, go right into uh, verse 19. <clears throat> whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments. So first of all, when we have a, a, a therefore uh, in the statement, we got to remember what the therefore is there for, right? So, uh, you know, he is, he is stating here that because of what we've said in verses 17 and 18, because of the preeminence of the law, the permanence of the law, the importance of the law, Therefore, whoever breaks one of these, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's based on what we have said about the importance and permanence of the law. And he's saying essentially that there's some consequences. There's some consequences of the way that we respond to the law because of what the law is, because of the, the criticality of the law, the preeminence of the law. There's some consequences to the way that we approach the law, the way that we think about the law, the way that we deal with the law. <clears throat> and he says here, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments. And I got to say that that word break there is uh, a, a very similar word to what we have up in verse 17, where Jesus says, I've not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. Destroy and break have the same root word. Uh, in them. So he's saying, I did not come to destroy the law. I did not come to break the law. But it appears that some of you are breaking the law. And he's particularly focused here on the Pharisees and scribes, as we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. But he's saying, you folks are breaking the law. You folks are destroying the law by the things that you are doing. And again, we'll get into a lot more details. But that's, you know, you got to recognize he's, he's giving you that. Uh, you know, that change that, that to show the difference between what he has come to do and what the and what the scribes and Pharisees are doing. <clears throat> now, he, he says <clears throat> this this really interesting statement, right, that therefore one breaks the least of these commandments. So he makes this kind of statement that there's 
least of these commandments and there's greater of these commandments. That there's uh, there's important ones and maybe ones that are not so important, right? Uh, which seems odd to us. So go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, verse 35. Matthew 22, 35. Mine starts this way. It says, then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love the neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. So here you see Jesus kind of also saying again, there's great, there's there's some kind of hierarchy uh, to the commandments. Some kind of, there's the greatest one here that, we, that he reads, the first and great one. And then there's a second one, right? Now, <clears throat> Go to James chapter 2. <clears throat> James chapter 2, verse 10. We have this interesting statement from James. <clears throat> James 2.10. Which says, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. He's saying regardless of the greatest, regardless of the leastness, <laughs> um, if you stumble at one point of the law, that you're guilty of committing, uh, guilty of being uh, against all of the law, guilty of transgressing the whole law. If you uh, if you stumble at one point, so he essentially says, frankly, it doesn't matter uh, whether there are greater ones or lesser ones. Uh, if you stumble on any part of it, you're breaking the whole law. So it really has to do with how we think about different pieces of the law. We tend to think, well, that's a minor point of the law. That's a minor uh, transgression, right? And so I think, again, if you go back to Matthew and what he has to say here, he says, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments, and if you can just think of the least in the way that we think about that they're greater or least, we think this is not that important. And he says, well, whoever even breaks one of the least of them shall be least in the kingdom of heaven. There's a consequence for that. So first of all, what does the law demand of us? What does the law require of us? Compliance. Compliance. Total compliance. Perfection. Total compliance. Perfection. Which yeah. Is, you know, man cannot keep. He just is not a perfect being. There's no way he can keep you know, all the commandments. Which gets right into the paradox that I brought up in the beginning, right? Thanks, Rich. <laughs> no, exactly on point. So if you look over at Matthew 5, 48, right? Um, you know, we're, we're going to get there not too long. Well, you know, within this year at least. Um, it says, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect, right? That is that is the, the standard. It's holiness. It's righteousness. Uh, it's a life lived in obedience to the law. <clears throat> That's what the expectation is. And Jesus is saying here essentially, do not imagine that I have come to make things easier for you by reducing the demands of the law. <laughs> That's not why I've come. I've come to enable you to keep the law, not to make things easier by changing the law or making it a lot easier for you to do the law. The law <laughs> is the law. And what I've actually come to do is to enable you to keep that law. God's law is permanent. It doesn't change. And I'm coming to enable you to keep that law. Any pushback there is before we go forward. Just, just you can just hold it for now because I'll, I'll, it'll come back again. Um, all right. So then he says, 
look again at what he says. For though if you break one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, show shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> All right, so what does it mean that you're least in the kingdom of heaven? First of all, it's kind of nice that you're in the kingdom of heaven, but what does it mean that you're least in the kingdom of heaven? And do you care? <laughs> Any thoughts? Since everybody is imperfect, no one is perfect. We cannot keep the law perfectly. Everybody who's a Christian, you know, is the least of us, every one of us. Because, you know, and we were created by God, uh, and he knows full well that we are an imperfect being. We are totally full of sin, and, and that's why Christ is there to fulfill. And uh, it's... My head's going to explode, Rich. <laughs> so, um, I agree with everything you've said, Tom. And so, so the point is we can't, you know, so he's saying if you do break one of the least of these commandments, you're least in the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean that you're least in the kingdom? What does that mean? <clears throat> All right, let me give you a little uh, way to think about that differently, and that is this. When we often... When I say the words the kingdom of heaven, where our mind jumps to um, eternal life, life after this time, right? We think about, well, when we get to heaven, uh, there's going to be, you know, the really important people and the not so important people. And then there's going to be Tom and then there's going to be, you know, other people, right? Hey, um, from there, that's, my, that's all I care about. <laughs> but I think I've you got seen lots of my friends there, too. <laughs> But I think you got to recognize when he talks about the kingdom, when Jesus talks about the kingdom, he's talking about the kingdom that begins now, right? He's talking about the kingdom that begins when he is there on earth. He's saying that, so he's saying that you are going to be least in the kingdom that begins now and, and goes all the way to heaven. So think about it that way. How could it be that you're least in the kingdom now? It's supposed to be servants. Okay, go that. Keep going there. So, what is that? What are you saying? So, as a servant, you know, we're serving. They were servants were considered least. We're you know, so we are supposed to be least. Yeah, everything. Everybody else is first. You almost had it, CT. <laughs> I, was, I was cheering you on. I thought you were going to get there. I wanted you to finish. I'd give it to you. All right. Good setup. Good setup. But let me say it this way. I think that we, we uh, this is this is the uh, human success mentality uh, that gets us stuck about thinking about what he means here. I think what he's saying is <clears throat> we're going to be least in the kingdom in the, in the way of our usefulness in the kingdom. Right. We can't be used by God in the kingdom as much if we are breaking God's law, right? He cannot bless us as much as he wants to if we are breaking God's law. And if you go all the way to heaven, he cannot reward us as much as he wants to if we break God's law. So he's saying you're going to be least in the kingdom in the impact that you have, in the impact that you have for me on earth, because you are breaking God's law, right? This makes sense, right? As, as we, the more that we sin, the less we are of impact for him in this world. And that's exactly what he's saying here, right? You're gonna be least in the kingdom. You're gonna be the least important person in the kingdom for me, for, for getting what I need to get done, done, if you continue to break the law, if you continue to be disobedient to what uh, I've asked you to do. Or if you teach, right? If you not only break it, but you teach others to break it. And we, and you know, this is uh, for most of you, this is like, wait a minute, I don't teach anybody. Oh, yeah, you do, right? You're teaching people every day by what you do. You're teaching people every day by what you say. You're teaching people about Christ, you're teaching people about the kingdom. You're teaching people whether it's important to obey or not. 
You're teaching people whether it's important to follow what God has said or not. So when he says, uh, and teach men so, that includes all of us. That's not just the Pharisees. That's just not the leaders, right? We're teaching people every day by the actions that we take. And he says, if you're teaching people not to keep the law by not keeping the law, then you're going to be least in the kingdom, uh, right? You're not going to have any impact on those people that you're teaching, those people that are listening to you, those people that are watching you. You're not going to have the impact that Christ wants you to have on them and for him if you're not obeying the law. Make sense? <clears throat> All right. Hey, Rich, I had a, just a question about the law. Yeah. Uh, so kind of going back, way back to, I think it's more of your introductory statement. Um, so, you know, when Christ is talking about the law here in Matthew, I mean, I think he's including the law uh, in the Ten Commandments, and then he's also including all the rabbinical teachings, all the Jewish law at that time. Um, <clears throat> you know, you could, and they tried the Pharisees, whatever, some of them actually could follow, you know, parts of that because they just looked at it as your actions only, your outward actions, like, hey, I'm, I'm you know, I'm doing this part. Yeah, I did that. I didn't kill anybody this week. I'm good. You know, like, you know, when Christ actually confronts, you know, one of the Pharisees, he said, yeah, I've kept all those commandments since birth, you know, and then, but then Christ now ex extends the law to more of a moral law to what are more past, you know, our actions and stuff. So anyways, I'm just as Gentiles, as non-followers of, 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 we're not Jews, um, you know, what part of the law, you know, is it just the Ten Commandments? Um, you know, obviously God's, ex you know, Christ has extended the law uh, to what it really should have been, you know, to our hearts. But anyways, I'm just uh, throwing some thoughts out there on what the law really is. Because, you know, Paul talks a lot about it, you know, and, and, and they talk a lot about the law and they're Jews. And so they have a different, I think, concept than we might have of what the law is the time. Anyways, just some thoughts. So, so Hugh, were you here last week? I was. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so let, let me say, I'm going to say two things about it right now, and then uh, honestly, we're going to deal with it in, in a few minutes as we get into, into verse 20. But as I mentioned last week, there's three parts to the law, the ceremonial, the judicial, and the moral, right? Christ said he came to fulfill the whole law. So when he fulfills the ceremonial law, right, which were the, the you know, the um, sacrifices and those kinds of things, right, that are in the Old Testament, he fulfills them with his own life, the sacrifice that he made, right? So the, so the ceremonial law essentially goes away because he has fulfilled it with his life. Same thing is true with the judicial law. The judicial law is what are the things we need to put in place to take care of sin, to deal with sin? And Jesus dealt with sin on the cross, so essentially fulfilled the judicial law, so the judicial law goes away because he fulfilled it in that sense. And then we talked last time about the last one, which is the moral law, right? So Christ fulfilled the moral law in his life. But if you remember, we also looked at the passages that said that he, uh, he, uh, be, his life not only fulfilled the law, but it allowed us to fulfill the law, to fulfill the moral part of the law. So the moral part of the law continues, even, uh, even though the, the judicial and the ceremonial have essentially passed away because he has fulfilled those. He's fulfilled the moral law, both in his life, but also in us. So that continues in us. So it, so that. So when we talk here about the law, we're mostly talking about the moral law. And so when I say that he came such that we can fulfill the law, I'm saying he came so that we can fulfill the moral law. Now, the moral law is fundamentally the Ten Commandments, but there's more to the moral law than just the Ten Commandments. And then we can get into that in some detail at some point. So let me just say that up front, but then let's go right. Let me just jump from there, Hugh, right into verse 20, because I think the other part of your question is, is really dealt with there. For verse 20 says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. 
<clears throat> so when he says righteousness here, he's talking about obedience to the moral law. He's saying, if you, unless your righteousness, unless your obedience to the law exceeds the, the obedience to the law of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. <clears throat> now, what is the purpose of the law for us today? You know the answer to this question. To lead us to Christ. To lead us to Christ. Why do you say that, Hugh? To to see where we are in relation to God's holiness and to seek Christ uh, through that. See exactly. how we, yeah, we fall short. Exactly. Purpose of the law is to show that that um, that you had to have more righteousness than you can come up with on your own. <laughs> go, go to Galatians chapter 3. That's the, the key verse that we always turn to in this regard. So Galatians chapter 3 is <clears throat> this uh, wonderful explanation of this. Galatians 3 verse 24. We've referred to this before. <clears throat> Right, Galatians 3, 24 says, therefore, the law was our tutor or disciplinarian to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Right, the law came to show us our sin, to show us that we could not do it on our own, to show us that we could not get to God by our own uh, righteousness, our own keeping of the law. The law for us is really to show us we can't do it. And even the Pharisees couldn't do it, right? We'll talk more about that. All right, before we get into the rest of Hugh's question, let's make sure we're on the same ground. Um, no, no, it's a, Hugh, Hugh is, is, is exactly the right question I want to deal with today, so it's good. So first of all, who were the scribes? We got here the scribes and Pharisees. Let's make sure we understand who they are. Who are the scribes? We've talked about them before, but what's your understanding? Leaders in the church. Uh, more than that, a little different from that. What were their what was their job? <clears throat> yeah, to document. To document. They they were the ones who studied the law who copied the law, right? Uh, no, not a jot or tittle will change, right? They were the ones who copied it and made sure it was accurate. They studied it and knew all the nuances of it. Uh, those uh, people that were scribes in those days, uh, in, in Jesus' day, uh, you know, became those today who are known as rabbis, right? It's the same group of people. Uh, they studied the law, they understood the law, and, and, to, and to CT's point, they became the leaders uh, now Right, they they were that in the church then though it was more they they were the ones who uh, spent the you know they were the professors of the law if you will right all right so then who were the Pharisees come on guys this is one on one stuff what, who were the Pharisees the sect of Jewish leaders the Jewish leaders. And what was their what was their main deal? They were the ones who were the most strict observers of the law. Right. They were the ones who were all about keeping the law and making sure the law was kept and and saw themselves above everybody else because they kept all the details of the law. Um, look at Luke chapter 18, and this is a very make, make, uh, this is a very important passage for us to understand what's going on uh, and getting into Hugh's question. So Luke chapter 18. Uh, we'll Richard, start. I think yeah. of that was like the religious police. You know, uh, the yeah. They Keeping were the, re the religious police, the religious, but they were the religious leaders. Recognized right. that the people would look, look up to the Pharisees. They were the ones, boy, I'm going to listen to him. He's got it together. 
he knows what's right. I'm going to follow after what they're going to do, right? They, they, uh, they looked up to them and they knew they couldn't attain those Pharisees. They were somebody special, right? So look at Luke 18. Go ahead. Both of these, both of these positions were self-appointed. I mean, they appointed themselves. Yeah, right, right. That's where authority came from. Self-appointed and self-important, yes. <laughs> Luke, Luke 18, uh, beginning of verse 9. We have this great picture of a Pharisee here in verse 9. <clears throat> it says, and also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So that introduction is very important, right? Uh, this is someone who was self-trusting, trusting in themselves, trusting in their own righteousness. Look at verse 10 then. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And of course, the tax collector was the dregs of society in that day, right? Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I, I just find that's funny. He, he, he prays with himself. Uh, you know, that's the only person that was important enough to him to pray with. Uh, anyway, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So it's just really a couple things here about this Pharisee. <clears throat> and look at verse 12. It says, I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. What was required of the law with regard to fasting? Does anybody know? What was required by the law was that you fast once a year. <laughs> and here's this Pharisee. He's fasting twice a week. Okay. So this is the situation that we have. The Pharisees continue to add things to the law and make them, uh, uh, and therefore show how important they were, because uh, I'm going to fast twice a week, you know, which is uh, way more than is actually required by the law, by what God has said. And so they made themselves very self-important because they did way more than the law. Like they were, and then they, of course, they expected everyone else to do that too. Right. They were the leaders. They were the example. <clears throat> and then, hey, you know, uh, we really think you ought to fast twice a week. That's the way you ought to do it. Uh, whereas the law actually required only once a year and they're doing it twice a week. Now, <clears throat> the Pharisee also, of course, he thinks he's just fine. Right. He thinks he's got it all together. He's following the law. He's following more than the law. Uh, but you'll notice down in verse 14, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, went to his house justified rather than the other. And then that great statement for everyone who humbles himself shall be humbled. And he who, excuse me, who exalts himself shall be humbled. He who humbles himself shall be exalted. That should remind you of Matthew 5, 3, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is exactly the opposite of the Pharisees. They're all about themselves. They're all about self-exaltation. They're all about showing how amazing they are. Whereas we have a tax collector who is poor in spirit, who understands his sin. The Pharisees <clears throat> were the Pharisees were unconscious hypocrites. They thought they were fine. They thought. They were fine based upon what they decided was important. Fasting twice a week, tithing on every little gnat and knit. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. But they thought that they were fine. They thought they were okay with God. They thought God was going to accept them because they decided what the rules were. They decided what was important and what was not important. <clears throat> so I got to ask you that same question right have you are you an unconscious hypocrite in the sense of you've decided what's important what makes a good christian and you're doing those things and not actually paying attention to what god has said <laughs> not actually saying 
paying attention to what God's law says, right? Maybe a good Christian means I go to church every Sunday. Maybe it means I do this and I do that. Maybe I uh, have certain language. Maybe, uh, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, have we invented our own set of rules as to what a good Christian is, and then we're following those rules, and so we're just fine? <laughs> I'm afraid we've all done this to a little bit. That's why I'm, you know, as you know, when I point one finger at you, I'm just 12 pointing back at me. I have lots of fingers. All right, <clears throat> so that's the first thing. So what what did Jesus have against the Pharisees? What was it about the Pharisees that, uh, that Jesus continues? You know, we're going to get into the woe section of Matthew a little bit later. But Jesus was always uh, getting on the Pharisees. So let's look at some scripture and let's, let's look at a little bit about the Pharisees. First of all, for the Pharisees, Religion was all external and formal, right? It was all about what you do, all about your actions. And if there's anything that we see that Jesus said is that that the um, that that religion is supposed to be something internal, it's supposed to be something about your heart. Let's just look at a couple of scriptures in Luke 16. Since we're there, go back to verse 15. 16:15 says and he said to them you are those who justify yourselves before men but god knows your hearts for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of god right so the pharisees again they're justifying themselves by what they're doing but god knows their hearts matthew chapter 15 Some of you are already thinking of other scriptures, I know. But Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. <clears throat> Matthew 15, 10. When he called the multitudes to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, do you not know that the Pharisees are offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. If the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. I'm always amazed. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, uh, the, the, the disciples over and over again did not understand what Jesus was saying in his parables and ask him to explain them. I, I just find that incredible. Anyway, uh, uh, explain this parable to us. Verse 16, so Jesus said, are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, fault witness, and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So again, that, that, that last point, what was going on here is the Pharisees were yelling at Jesus because the disciples were not washing their hands before they eat. And again, they had added to the law saying, unless you wash your hands before you eat, right, you are committing sin against the law. And Jesus is saying, it's not about washing your hands. It's about what comes out of your mouth. It's about your heart. And then finally, in Matthew 23, and we're going to go to Matthew 23 a couple of times in case you want to keep a finger there. But in Matthew 23, verse 25, <clears throat> this is the woe section. Let's just read, read one of them. Matthew 23, 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee first cleanse the inside of the cup, and dish that the outside of them may be clean also woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you are like whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness right they looked great on the outside everybody venerated them but inside they're wretched uh they're they're distasteful 
uh, this is a, th this is the big thing that he had to say about them constantly. They were all about extor externalities and formalities and not about their heart. Um, <clears throat> so one of, one of the quotes I ran into was, uh, religion is that which a man does in his solitude, right? Religion is that what a man does in his solitude. It's the conversation that you have with yourself about the law, about sin, that's important, not what other people see, not what you do externally. That's not the important part, but the important part is what you're, what the conversation is that you're having with yourself. What is it that you hide from the world, right? What is it you hide from the world? That's what, that's the heart. <laughs> that, that, what's the sin you hide from the world? What, what, what does Jesus know about your heart that others don't know? The Pharisees were all about the external, and they didn't care anything about the heart. As a Christian, it's all about the heart. All right, the second thing, so the Pharisees were all about the externals. Connected to that was they're all concerned about the ceremonial, right? It's, it's about the, the, the things that you do. You know, I've done my duty. <coughs> I tithe. I go to church. I wear nice clothes. I clean up my language, right? Again, all those ceremonial things. All those external things. And then kind of narrowing it into the, I think the point that he was making a little bit earlier. <coughs> and that is, they interpret the law, they interpreted the law so that they really did not have to do the law. <laughs> they interpreted the law such they really didn't have to follow it. They invented these other things so that they really didn't have to do what the law intended. So look at Mark chapter 7. It's a great passage. Mark chapter 7. <coughs> um, let's start at verse 6. Again, he's in the middle of this conversation with the scribes and Pharisees. Mark 7. Excuse me. Verse 6. Says he answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That's a key phrase right there, right? Teaching as doctrines, teaching as the law what is really just the commandments of men. Then verse eight, for laying aside the commandments of God, you told the tradition of men. What? You hold. you hold. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. So again, the Pharisees were saying, you know, these people didn't wash their hands. They used a dirty cup, right? And that was the things that, that was going to keep them out of heaven. And Jesus saying, you are missing the point entirely. Verse nine, he said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your traditions, right? So they were, the, <clears throat> the Pharisees were saying, keep these traditions, do these things, and you'll be okay. Meanwhile, they were rejecting the commandments of God. And then he gives this incredible example in verse 10. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And he who cursed his father and mother, let him be put to death, right? Verse 11, but you say, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might receive from me is Corban, that is a gift of God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down and many such things you do. So this idea of Corbin in, in verse 11, what was going on was that uh, a man would come in and say, uh, you know, I, my mother and, and father, uh, they need help, uh, but uh, I don't want to give them help. <coughs> so so they would go into the priest and they would say all of their wealth uh, was a gift to God <coughs> or Corbin. It was a gift to God. So therefore, if it's a gift to God, I can't give it to my parents, right? Even though they would spend it on their own stuff and do whatever they wanted with it, uh, they would just uh, announce that it was this gift to God uh, and uh, you know, maybe they would tithe from it, right? So it would, the priest would get something out of it. Um, but but that then they didn't have to give any money to take care of their parents. And Jesus is saying, 
what what a craziness is that, right? The law clearly states that you are to honor your father and mother, and and you are you have invented this new rule called Corbin, this new rule that says you can just announce that your wealth is something else and get out of doing what the law says. So this was just one example that Jesus uses just to show them the kinds of things that they're doing over and over. Look again at Matthew chapter 23, if you kept your finger there. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Matthew 23, 23. Again, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law justice, mercy, faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So he's saying the Pharisees, you know, they are paying tithe on every little thing that they have, every little plant, every little seed, every every every, every little uh, uh, piece of thing that they have in their house. They're tithing on those, but they're leaving out the big stuff, right? They're leaving out justice and mercy and faith. So, so again, they, they, they focused all their attention on little bitty pieces of the law and left out the big important things. And they said, we're just doing fine because we're doing all these little bitty things. They, they created these traditions, these ways to follow the law. And essentially what it was, was rationalizing then their own sin, right? They found ways to rationalize their sin, their way of not keeping the law because of these traditions and these things that we invented. Now, unfortunately, we still do this today, <laughs> right? We rationalize our own sin. We rationalize uh, our being able to sin uh, as much as we think is uh, okay. So how do we do this? Um, <clears throat> just some examples. One, selective comparisons. I'm certainly better than Tom, <laughs> right? So I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm sorry, Tom. I, I shouldn't pick on you entirely. <laughs> I hurt my feelings. Don't worry about it. Russell's, Russell's not here. <laughs> Got to pick on something. Got a thick skin. <clears throat> but don't we do this, right? I'm certainly better than them. I, I attend church more regularly. I, you know, I, I uh, help out and do this and I do that and I do the other. I certainly do those things and those people are not doing that. And, you know, they they're you know, I've heard about some other things that they've done and they 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 right. Right. Selective comparison. The other one is uh, moderation in our sin. It's like I have control over my sin. I only do it in moderation. I only do it a little bit. I, I'm not sinning a lot. I'm certainly not sinning as much as somebody else would be who is not a Christian. I'm a Christian, so I'm only sinning a little bit. And Jesus says we're going to sin. We're all, you know, as Tom said earlier, we're all imperfect, right? We're all going to mess up. So I'm just sinning in moderation, and uh, and and uh, and so therefore I'm okay. Um, appealing to some kind of human ideology to rationalize our sinful decisions, you know, because I I believe such and such. I'm a uh, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat or I'm a liberal or I'm a, a feminist or I'm a whatever. Therefore, I can do these sinful things because it, it supports my uh, my ideology. Uh, or, or saying this, <coughs> I know it may appear to you be, to be sin, but I know my heart. I know I'm really not sinful. Uh, it may appear, it may look to you like sin. It may look like I'm breaking something, but no, in my heart, I know I'm okay. Or, I, you know, this is certainly, the, the only reason I'm sinning is, is because of what Fred did. Right? I'm only sinning, it's his fault really that I'm sinning. I wouldn't have sinned if it wasn't, wasn't what he did. Uh, that's the reason I'm sinning. It's somebody else's fault that I'm sinning. Or which, which is connected to, I really didn't have a choice but to sin in this particular situation. I didn't really have a choice. You know, I was I was stuck uh, between a rock and a hard place. I had to sin in order to, to move forward. I, you know, I, I, in order for my to be successful in my job, in order to get along with this group, in order that I didn't get ridiculed. Uh, you know, I really I really didn't have a choice. And in fact, I'm a victim. 
uh, I'm a victim here. You know, I was the one who got uh, abused and hurt. And so therefore, you know, me lashing back, you know, was, was just something I had to do. I, I'm a victim here. And by the way, <clears throat> I know I'm sinning now, but but I'm going to get better. I'm going to I'm going to deal with that. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, next year I'm really going to get serious about that sin and I'm going to get that out of my life. Right. I'm going to I'm going to really or, or maybe the year after that, you know, because next year is going to be really busy. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll deal with that. I'll deal with that a little bit later. Uh, you know, maybe you don't say any of these things out loud. I hope you don't anyway. But these are the things that go on in the back of our heads. Right. And by the way, God's will is for me to be happy. He certainly wouldn't deny me of anything that would make me happy. Certainly, he wouldn't deny me of watching that or getting involved in that or doing that. And by the way, it's not a big sin. It's just one of those little sins, right? I'm, I certainly wouldn't do one of those big sins. I'm only doing, it's just a little sin. So anyway, I, I think just to, to recognize, you know, what Jesus had against the Pharisees about them kind of reinventing what it means to be obedient, what it means to follow the law is the same thing that we do in rationalizing the, that we're still sinning, <laughs> that we're still involved in sin. So, <clears throat> all right. Did I, did I, did I hit everybody there or did I miss someone? I can, I got more on the list. <laughs> all right. All right. Good question. Yeah. I, I just wanted this that we always talk about what's in a person's heart or what what they believe. Where do you know where the origin of that came from? Of of, of man's belief that that the heart was the the, um, the the center of what a person felt or believed, as opposed to the mind or the brain. Yeah, I think that we we may have talked about this once before, um, but but I think that when they talked about the heart, they weren't talking about the blood pumper, right? right? They were just talking about the essence of the human, right? Why what was their personality? They just called it the heart. Now, why? I don't know. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting question, but I'm not sure. All right. Uh, the next thing, why, why was Jesus upset with them? Uh, they were primarily concerned about themselves. Remember when, we, when uh, he talked about what is, what is the... Uh, what is the law? He said, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? And love your neighbor as yourself. Well, in the first one, they were not lo about loving the Lord God. It's interesting when you look back at that story of the Pharisee and the publican, right? He says he went in to pray, and his whole prayer was about that other guy. <laughs> it wasn't about worshiping God. It wasn't about saying how amazing God is or how thankful I am for God, or, or frankly, how wretched I am for my own sin. It was His whole prayer was about that other guy and what his problems are and how much better I am than him, uh, how, uh, how, how, how I was building myself up uh, in my own eyes, not, uh, not, not recognize my own sin. Uh, look at, um, you know some of you by heart, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but there's a piece of it you may have missed. So turn there a minute. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. <clears throat> Again, you, you know these verses. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We, we, we get the first part of that, but don't miss the last part, right? Lest anyone should boast. <laughs> this just drives us right back to poor in spirit, right? The, this, the Pharisees were all about boasting about how amazing they were, how self-righteous they were, how they had it together. Um, and again, this is not something we may do out loud, but we do it in talking to ourselves. Again, if the conversation with ourselves is the important conversation, the conversation that we have about our own sin and about our own self, are we boasting to ourselves about ourselves? <laughs> I'm doing just fine. I'm doing great. I've got it together. I'm doing what I need to do, certainly compared to X, Y, Z, right? <clears throat> and, and, and Ephesians here tells us, lest any man should boast. If you're boasting even to yourself about yourself, 
that uh, we shouldn't be because because again it ought to drive us right back to Matthew 5 3 blessed are the poor in spirit we're self-satisfied because frankly we're comparing ourselves to others and then finally the last thing is as I mentioned love the Lord God with all your heart love your neighbor as yourself right he says that is the essence of the law was the was the Pharisee doing that as he was in the room with the publican no right he was tearing him down he was uh, ripping him apart uh, he was certainly uh, he was building himself up by tearing the other guy down, right? Now, we got to be careful in this because we uh, we tend to do this when we get together and uh, we want to show how important we are. And I'll have this conversation with Hugh going, what about that rotten guy or those rotten people or those people who do that? Aren't they rotten, Hugh? Don't you agree, Hugh, that those are Hugh, uh, rotten people, those people those, uh, you know, <clears throat> I don't even want to name a group, but you know what I'm talking about, right? We make ourselves feel better by tearing down some other group. And I think that's exactly what the Pharisee was doing uh, with, the, with the publican. And, 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 and we don't often do that by ourselves, but we do it a lot when we get together and we just enjoy tearing another group of people down, whoever they are. All right. <clears throat> so Jesus is interested not in the doing, but in the being, right? It's not about the external. It's not about the ceremony. It's about the being. It's the be attitudes. And the other thing I'll say, being a Christian is a 24-7 full-time job, right? It's not just for Sunday morning. It's not just when you interact with your Christian friends as compared to those other friends or those other people that you interact with. Right? It's about a being. Now, well, you're running out of time, <clears throat> but we got to get this last point in because it's critical. What does he say? We still haven't finished. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Does this mean that we enter the kingdom of heaven by works? All right, everyone agrees no to that answer. All right. Uh, if you need a good scripture uh, that I hadn't seen in a while, Galatians 2.16, we won't look at it today, but you can put it down as a reference. It's a really powerful one about that. Now, does this mean that works do not matter? Of course not. <clears throat> of course not. So what is the role of works and why, why is our righteousness, our, our works righteousness important? I mean, as a Christian, you should, <clears throat> being a, a Christ follower, your work should manifest as a result of that. It's You don't do it for self-promotion. You don't do it for approval of other people. It should kind of emanate from within because Christ is, is within you, in my understanding. And all for the glory of God. It's proof. Like it's it proof. Works, works is a lot. Uh, to, works to the Christian is kind of like baptism. You know, baptism doesn't get you into heaven. Baptism is a outward expression, an outward demonstration of something that's happened to you inwardly. And works is an outward expression of what's inside you as far as Christ is concerned. Yeah, all good. So, anyway, yeah. I've, I've always liked uh, the verse that we didn't read, mm -hmm. 15, 10, where it goes, for we are God's workmanship created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Like I've always felt like there's, there's specific things out there that God's made just prepared for me to do. Some of them may be just for me. There are others that are made for a lot of people to do. I'm just going to be the one that picks that one to do. Uh, so, I mean, that's why I think works are important because God's planned them for us. That's good. That's a that's a really good ad. What was that scripture? That was it. Uh, uh, 
two ten, right? Ephesians two ten. Yeah. yeah. One other but, thing. Could I add another scripture? If, if yeah, I, uh, please. Hebrews eleven six, and we're all familiar with with that. Without without faith, it's impossible to please God, and that's where we start. That's what pleases God. But we sometimes overlook or neglect the second part of that verse that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, seeking him, not casually, but there's some diligence in that. There's purpose in that. There's there's uh, there's meditation. There's effort. There's uh, applying God's word to your life and seeking to... God loves other people. So, therefore, you know, all those things are seeking, seeking diligently seeking God. Good. Good. I think uh, also we have to return to the source of our works. You know, why why are we doing, you know, sometimes we do do work because our, we're not really there and, and we still, you know, maybe our hearts aren't quite, I think it's important to do them even when we don't feel it is what I, uh, sometimes, we, and we should feel it, um, but, you know, I think it's important to turn to why we do things. And, you know, there, and there's a verse in John, they were talking about works and Christ said, this is the, the works, the work of God. And he said, the work of God is believe in the one he sent. And so sometimes we have to, I think, turn back to why we're doing them, even though we still need to do them, even if, even if we're not quite there with our emotions. Yeah. Good. I mean, you put this phrase in your head, faith showing itself by works is the mark of a true Christian. Faith showing itself by works, right? Faith showing itself by works is the mark, is the proof. Someone used the word earlier, right? The, the, the works are the proof that, that faith is real within you. I, I just want to end with, uh, with one passage and then uh, we'll close out. First John chapter 5. <clears throat> Sometimes you stumble on these things and you go, I know I've read that before, but boy, that's good. First John chapter five, <clears throat> verse one. First John, right before second John, in case you can't find it. First John chapter five, verse one. Says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him, who begot also loves him. Let me read that again in English. Whoever believes in Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? I just love that in the middle of verse 3, right? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. We love his commandments. We love his law. We love keeping it. That's the mark. That's the test. That's the proof. So, the paradox. It's impossible for us to keep the law. But his purpose in coming was to enable us to keep the law, <laughs> to enable us to be obedient to the law. And that is hungering and thirsting after righteousness, right? Hungering and thirsting after keeping the law. Hungering and thirsting after following and being obedient to God's law. All right, any other comments before we go to prayer? All right, we will close this out. I'll stop the recording and we'll turn over to, to Hugh.